Okay, let's grade the Yankees trade deadline this year, 2021. Overall, I mean, I give them a pretty high mark. And for, for reasons, okay, several reasons. And so let's start with Clay Holmes, the first guy. And I'm, I'm going out about a week leading up to the deadline. So, because the Yankees traded for Clay Holmes of uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates. I was not excited to see them, you know, get rid of Hoysian Park. I think they added Diego Castillo to him, but... Jean Park is, you know, he, he had a lot of intangibles that were appealing for, that I thought, and a lot of people thought were appealing for the Yankees, but clearly their, analy their analytics department thought otherwise. But the other thing is he wasn't in their top 30 prospects, and there were several guys that are very, very highly regarded that the Yankees, you know, see a, uh, that above him, and they would give opportunities before they would give him an opportunity, like Anthony Volpe and Oswald Peraza and some guys like that. And they did trade away Josh Smith, but we'll get to that. But uh, it's eh. the one thing that he has that those other guys don't have is Hoi Jean Park was a lefty, and uh, the other guys are righties. But nevertheless, Clay Holmes, and he's been solid for them so far. He's thrown shutout innings uh, every time he's been up so far at the Yankees. So, so far, so good. That was the first kind of trade. The, the, and then, you know, the three days leading up to the deadline, the first big trade was, you know, a big one, Joey Gallo, the Texas Rangers. Gallo and Joely Rodriguez, and the Yankees gave up four prospects in the back and uh, in return. It was initially going to be six prospects for um, Gallo and John King, but they found something in his medicals that they didn't like. So they swapped out John King for Joely Rodriguez, and the prospect package changed. And um, But they still got they got um, two prospects in the top 30. I think they were number 9 and 12, if I remember correctly. And um, the other two in, in, in the 20s. So... You know, a solid trade, and that's going to pay dividends. I mean, you know, they're both under control until next year, so which will be good. So they'll be here until 2022 as well, so that they'll get time to adjust, just like Clay Holmes would. Even though I think Clay Holmes is a free agent at the end of the season, I think um, this trade was also addressed their need for another left-handed hitter and some outfield depth and versatility. He's got a great arm. Gallo is a great defender. He's a great teammate. You know, he gives him versatility in the lineup and allows Boone to kind of alternate lefty, righty, lefty, righty. Which is good. And again, he's an elite defender, and you know, and he's got 25 home runs this year too, which is more than all the Yankees hitters combined this year. So they did bring in some serious offense too. Pairing him with the next trade was Anthony Rizzo, and I think was a surprise for a lot of us. A lot of folks were thinking Trevor Story. I was thinking Trevor Story for a while as well. I thought it was going to be like a Trevor Story, John Gray type of thing, or a Trevor Story, Daniel Bard, but Colorado didn't move any of those guys. So. Um, you know, which d didn't make sense to me because now they're just going to give him, you know, I, I think they're going to give Story a, a qualifying offer. He's going to sign elsewhere and they're going to get up just a, a prospect for him. That, um, you know, and that's what they're going to do. So with that said, Rizzo brings in another left-handed hitter and he's so far, he's been, he's hit home runs in every game. The Yankees only been two, but he's hit a home run in each game. And he, he brings another, you know, not only the left-handed skill set and excellent defense like like Gallo, but in the infield, he also brings a leadership and tangibles with him. And this is something that the Yankees have sorely lacked this year. Judge is not the guy. Stanton's not the guy that, you know, kind of a, a, a vocal leader. And Rizzo's the type of guy who wouldn't be afraid to call a team meeting and just kind of rile people up, kind of like Jason Hayward did with, in 2016 when, they, in the, when the Cubs won the World Series and they had that rain delay going into the ninth inning. He really called that team meeting, kind of reset the focus, and they came back out and they won the whole thing. So he's that type of guy, and he's a great clubhouse guy, you know, just a hell of a player, hell of a defender. He's a hell of a first baseman, and I would not be surprised if they brought him back after this. He's a free agent at the end of the season, so I wouldn't be surprised if they brought him in for a three- or four-year deal. But I wouldn't be surprised if he went back to the Cubs either. So... But if they do bring him back, they did say something. That, that, that tells me that Luke Voigt is all but gone. I mean, I, they were trying to – it was interesting because initially there was interest in him at the trade deadline, and then the interest was not there later on, you know, approaching the deadline. So I'm wondering if he'll get more interest in the offseason. I think he will if he establishes that he's healthy and he's being productive. He'll get a heck of a lot more interest, especially if he's, you know, he's reclaimed that power that he's had and he's hitting the ball well like he did last year um, when he was the MLB home run leader. With three years of control, he won't be a free agent until 2025. He would fetch a he would fetch a nice return. So, and speaking of return, we don't even know what the return is after when the Yankees traded Luis Sessa and Justin Wilson to the Cincinnati Reds. We have no idea what the return is. So, that remains to be seen as well. And uh, so, at some point, we'll figure that one out too. But and then the last trade was Andrew Heaney. So, um, 
And he came here from the Los Angeles Angels. They traded a couple of prospects. One of them's named Junk. So, <laughs> and they got a, a couple infield prospects for for Rizzo as well. Um, you know, Cubs. You know, they revamped their system. They <laughs> they tore it all down. The Nationals tore it all down. Well, Cubs mostly tore it down. They still have some guys there, but uh, the Nationals really tore it down. But they both restocked the systems. A lot of high end pro prospects. So, and um, but I'm glad to have Rizzo. Glad to have Gallo. We'll see what happens with Andrew Heaney. I think it gives him another, you know, arm in the rotation to help take the load off the starters and the relievers. So hopefully he can go out and just throw five or six every time out, put him in a position to be competitive or to win. And uh, maybe a change of scenery might do him some good as well. I mean, his stats weren't don't don't jump off the books or anything like that, but he's got some he's got some pretty good stuff. And if they figure something out to help him, you know, get get a, get a little bit more out of it this year, he's a free agent at the end of the season too. So, and he's not that old either. So. Uh, you know, another arm in the rotation. So the so the Yankees essentially got, you know, uh, uh, an outfielder, two left-handed bats, an outfielder and an infielder. Okay, three relief pitchers. Okay, and excuse me, two relief pitchers and a starting pitcher at the deadline. But the most important thing that I haven't mentioned yet is Cashman. Brian Cashman got the Texas Rangers to eat Gallo salary for the rest of the year and um, Joely Rodriguez. Salary for the rest of the season, and he got the Cubs to eat Rizzo's salary for the rest of the season. He saved the Yankees nine million dollars. Okay, that's nine million dollars that they did not assume. That's and so they dealt, you know, with some of their prospects, and they they did give up about four uh, top thirty prospects, but they didn't give up anybody in their top five for any of these trades. So that's part of his. That's part of the Cashman genius that a lot of people don't talk about. And this is where he, you know, he gets the upper hand on a lot of a lot of GMs. And fortunately, they're in the they're in the position where they had a lot of depth in the system in certain positions, and they were able to afford to, you know, uh, move some of it for these big pieces. But it clearly showed that they were going for it. But he did it in such a way, like the Dodgers, their payroll is going to be almost three hundred million now just by the moves that they made, which is insanity. So. But the Yankees did not assume they're still under the $210 million threshold. Which And, and now, this year, there's no uh, waiver deadline. There's usually one in August. At the end of August, there's no waiver deadline this year. So there's going to be no more moves made. So this is it. Unless they bring in somebody who is toiling around in the Mexican League or something like that, which I don't think they'll do. The Yankees are going to remain under the $210 million threshold or reset the tax penalty and be back down to the lower tax so that they can spend, which I think they'll spend this offseason. And it depends... I think some of it depends on what they do with Gallo, not Gallo, Rizzo and Voight. If they bring Rizzo back, then obviously they have first base occupied, which means I think DJ stays at second, Glaber stays at short. If they don't and they move Voight too, then it tells me they're going to move DJ to first, Glaber to second, and go after one of these shortstops. And uh, there's going to be four of them that are going to be free agents. So if it were me, it would be Corey Seager because it's another lefty and he's playoff tested and he's just a good, he's the youngest of, and he's a very, very good athlete. So he'd be the guy I'd go after. But we'll see what they do. I'm really interested. And they need to get a number two, like a, a legitimate number two behind uh, Garrett Cole to compliment him, to compliment the rest of this rotation. We need another stabilizer in there. So I could see them being pretty aggressive this offseason. And um, whether it be trades or free agency or a little bit of both, but they will have a reset um, payroll structure, and uh, they will they'll be paying a twenty percent uh, tax instead of I think a fifty five or sixty percent. So it's a huge difference. Um, so, but all in all, I give Cashman I give him I give Cashman the Yankees an A minus. I think had it been like a Luis Castillo or Jose Barrios that they brought in as a starting pitcher, it would have been a straight up A. But to me. I don't know what we're going to get from Andrew Haney. Uh, as excited I am as the possibilities, it's still not a Jose Berrios or a Max Scherzer. I didn't think they were going to get Scherzer anyway, but Berrios I thought was possible, even Luis Castillo. But A minus A minus is still uh, a lot better than I thought they were. I, I thought I was going to give them C you know C uh, minus or like a D plus. I didn't think he was going to do much because he generally doesn't do a lot to trade that line, particularly one when he's sitting right under a payroll threshold and looking to reset it. So he pulled some genius moves. Um, and I don't know how in the hell he did got those teams to pay that money, but he did it. He did it. So well done, Cashman. Let me know what you think. What What are your grades for what they did? Um, you know, let me know in the comments down below. I'm really curious to see it. As I mean, at the Dodgers, I think pulled an A, and you know they were the big uh, <clears throat> the big ones. I think the Blue Jays a minus, Padres a B, Giants B plus. 
you know, teams like that. And uh, even even a Tampa Bay Rays, right about a B. Oakland A's, B. So White Sox, A-. minus. You know, bring in, uh, I, I didn't think they were going to get Craig Kimbrell in there. <laughs> I did not. But adding him to uh, to Liam Hendricks and Michael Kopech, that's a three-headed monster in a bullpen. That's going to be a fearsome tripod right there. So let me know what you think, guys.